you of course need to make sure that your story still makes sense with the figures that you've just made. Yeah, yeah, it, it's handy to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure otherwise someone will tell you at some point that this makes zero sense, I hope. But, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the 34th episode of the Struggling Scientist podcast. This is a podcast by scientists, for scientists, anybody science adjacent, and perhaps even hobbyists. My name is Zonne and I'm here with my co-host Jaron. Hey. Today we're going to make an episode about writing tips for academic writing or scientific writing. And we're going to talk about our experiences with that. So let's start. Now, we aren't professional writers or anything, but we have both written and published in some uh, some journals and written some academic papers. And we thought it would be really interesting to talk about uh, what our experiences are and what we have learned from it today. And our episode is a, is a week late and it's actually really funny because it's a week late because I was actually busy, busy finishing one of my papers and um, sending it in. So uh, really on topic for today's, uh, for today's episode. Lessons learned indeed. In lessons learned very, very, very recently. Yes. <laughs> we think we have some uh, useful information and some tips and tricks and uh, stuff that we struggled with during the writing process. Yes, it's all still very fresh also for me as last week a paper, w- my paper was accepted. Or not accepted, oh, congratulations. but Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, what we do is of course, well, we're basic scientists. Um, and that's of course different than some other forms of academic writing, right? And I think it's um, called a bit more like scientific writing, what we do. And it's a form of writing that always has a very clear structure, like an abstract, an introduction, a materials and methods where you write exactly the experiment that you did, then your results, and then a discussion, of course, to discuss how relevant your paper is. So we think that some of our tips are, are way more focused on the scientific writing, but there's also quite some things that are more general for academic writing, I think, right? Yeah, indeed. And I mean, I think there are pretty practical tips uh, in general for yes. how to get it done. Yeah. So, so um, you can always find us, of course, if you're interested in what we have written so far. Uh, for me, you can find the uh, Fawau uh, papers. I don't have a Fawau at all yet, but hopefully soon. And Jaron has some Habibi at all papers. Yes. Yes. 20, 2022, look up uh, look up that. And... Also 2021, right? Yeah, but as a second author. Well, uh, and a review, I guess, yes. Yeah, yeah, my other paper was a f- shared first, but I'm not the first first, so it's not a wow at all, but I hope hope to get one soon. Yes. Well, let's start and get right into our, uh, our tips. Uh, the first one is to make a good plan for starting. And what really helps me is to chop it up into really um, bite-sized pieces almost and make those pieces seem a bit more doable and less daunting. And then also whenever you've done this bite-sized piece, you can sign off that you did it and it really feels like you make a bit more progress. That really helps me when trying to plan and organize for a paper and get stuff done. So it really builds up the confidence that you can keep going. Yeah. And and re- really make it teeny tiny pieces. Even if you just have to, for example, fix one figure, add that to your to-do list so that you can sign it off. Like, I did that today. What else would constitute uh, a tiny bite-sized piece at the beginning of writing your paper for you? Oh, that's a difficult one. I think maybe just even writing the results that goes with one figure. Mm-hmm. And it it really depends on how difficult things are. For example... The discussion is something I, I struggled with. And that's also really difficult to chop up into bits, right? Mm-hmm. So that's something that that was more difficult for me to write than anything else. Yeah. Because for everything else, for example, materials and methods, you can chop it up into all these different parts that you can do mm-hmm. and that are easily accomplishable in a day or an hour even or yeah. and then then you can sign it off and then you feel like oh yeah i've accomplished something now i can move on to the next task and you can really feel like you have finished something but yeah chopping it up that also depends a bit on what kind of person you are and what works for you yeah and how much time you have available to work on the paper uh, while well, everything else you're doing during the pg of course I guess. yes exactly and that's also why i like chopping it up because it means that even though you don't have a full day of writing because you're also doing a million experiments even if you have just w- done one tiny thing, it still feels like you've worked and made progress. Not true. 
So, oh, nice. Yeah. But it's really hard to find time in mm. between all your experiments to work on the paper. That's something I struggle with so much. Yes, especially when everything is a priority, right? Yes, mm. indeed. Or at least everything is being told uh, told to you as a, a priority. So. Mm -hmm. so I guess that then brings us on to our next uh, uh, tip for writing, is to uh, think about what the story is or that you are going to tell in relatively big, uh, big lines, big overall uh, terms for the story. And uh, don't be afraid to change it up afterwards when you get feedback on the overall story of the paper. Yeah, yeah, I, I think sometimes as scientists, we focus a bit more on the data and not actually like uh, a bit more on, on the story and how, how you don't actually have to tell stuff in the order that it happened, right? You nope. can easily switch it up to make um, the data more understandable for the reader because in the end, you are trying to almost sell your research in the form of a story that is your paper and you don't want it to be boring because boring is the enemy uh, of of reading of people reading your paper you want it to be interesting stay interesting um, of course tell all the facts and and your uh, your experiments and everything but it's important to also think about um, the reader the the path that you you are taking the reader on and the storyline that is in there yeah, and I wouldn't necessarily say it like you're just trying to sell your research, but you're also just trying to communicate the the, the important bits of your research as clearly as possible to your mm -hmm. reader, right? Like not everyone has gonna is going has the time to sit down and read two hours straight to the entire paper and figure out everything about it. Um, so it needs to be a clear, concise way of understanding it, and a story helps with that. Yeah. So. Yeah, and also just to make sense, like, am I gonna start with my mice experiment or am i gonna start with my qpcr and then move on to i don't know the lipidomics mm -hmm. um and and how are you gonna take your reader along on that journey and how are you gonna make them understand why it's important to see the qpcr data mm -hmm. and why it's important to do these other experiments and and yeah, take them along in that. It's important. Yes, it's definitely easier to sort of remember, like, the, the, the paper started with this. From there, they, they saw that and they went on to do this yeah. because, like that, it, then information, 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 it's not connected. No, and I think that the, the original uh, sort of um, structure of the papers with the abstract introduction, materials and method results, blah, 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 mm -hmm. made that a bit more difficult almost. Mm -hmm. But for example, in nature, you now really see that they are moving away from this and they don't have a separate introduction and a separate discussion anymore. They're just telling one nice flowing story. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you know to look what to look for for an introduction, you can sort of see what the introduction part is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But they don't really have these, these distinct parts anymore. And then the materials and methods often in the... In the um, supplementary info mm -hmm. but they are now way more moving to this like nice flowing storyline of, of a paper yeah no for yeah. sure so. and then the next tip is to start with making the figures or the tables of whatever research you have done um, and uh, make those first before you start writing anything else because then you can sort of see if it makes sense with your story um, see it, what the, what the order of it makes sense sort of get into your head like this is what I'm what I'm going to tell about this uh, and also get an overview of everything you have and I think that's important yes it's also honestly my favorite part to make the figure so I always like to start with that yeah I think for the most part at least uh, in the biomedical research I think it's everyone's favorite part to work on the figures necessarily to because I mean the figures are going to highlight the entire research right yeah it's what you have done yes so it also just depends on what kind of figures you have to work with. If it, uh, Speaking from reading uh, more clinical papers with a lot of tables on patient... I can imagine that yeah. that's less yeah. fun. Yeah, That's rough. <laughs> and it's also just hard to remember what exactly some of the data was just because it's presented in a way that's so, sort of monotone, I guess. Maybe mm -hmm. that's not the right word, but yeah. So figures definitely help uh, in trying to convey it as best as possible uh, and yeah. figuring, out, figuring out how... To translate what you what you make in your figures into the text, uh, yeah, and really spend also some time on trying to figure out what the best type of figure is to mm -hmm. present your data in. Yeah, because ultimately that's the thing that your your read. I don't know about you, but often when I oftentimes uh, when I look up articles, I see the abstract and I look at the figures very quickly. Yes, yes. So 
that's what most people are going to see, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then if you have made sure that the st you, of course, need to make sure that your story still makes sense with the figures that you've just made, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's handy to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure otherwise someone will tell you at some point that this makes zero sense, I hope. But, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, after you've uh, made the figures and uh, your story still uh, makes a little bit of sense, uh, you can then start writing the results based on the figures that you have. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then you, of course, again, need to make sure that the story makes sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a continuous process. Yes. But, um, yeah, result writing, I think it's a, an interesting part. Yes. I don't hate result writing. I mean, it's what you, it's sort of just describing what the data is, right? Yeah. I mean. Yeah, but it is important to, um, again, take your reader also along in this part. Because mm -hmm. you're not just drumming up cold facts. You are. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no joking, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, now that we're actually writing, as in typing down words, it might be handy to uh, use some resources that help us write a little bit better, mm -hmm. a bit more efficiently. Um, and one sort of free resource that anyone can use and just download easily would be Grammarly. Again, just to, just to reiterate, we're not sponsored by Grammarly in any way. Sadly. Unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> But uh, they're a completely free tool that you can use to write and it'll check for, your, for any grammatical errors in your writing and uh, highlight them and you can sort of choose to change it or... Uh, yeah, yeah, they accept. also give tips if, you, if, if a sentence flows better in a different way sometimes. Yep. And of course, in scientific papers, it doesn't always work because mm -hmm. it's different than normal writing, but it's a, it's a nice thing to have. I really like it because it reminds me to add commas in my sentences. Ah, yeah. When my sentences get a little long. Normally, I could <laughs> just break that down, but uh, every now and then it reminds me to add a comma. Yes. Uh, in addition to Grammarly, um, and this is sort of dependent on how many other authors are on the paper and how closely you're working with them with the writing process as well, uh, you can also consider something like Google Docs if you're both writing, the, uh, if you and someone else or multiple people are writing simultaneously on the paper. Um, because with Google Docs, you can sort of do that sort of in asynchronously and um yeah make suggestions or edits or and you can also decide who can actually make changes to the paper and who can just suggest to make changes to the paper yes uh, so everyone has the latest version and, and and depending on who you want they can make changes as well it's really nice but it yeah. can be really hard to get some of the more old school people to work with you <laughs> no 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 old school <laughs> ah, yeah, <yes. laughs> um, to work with you on on something like google docs no for sure but it is definitely handy it's completely free and yes. it, it it has if quite you, a lot if of you benefits. can manage to convince them definitely definitely do it and honestly it's not that different from words just like the buttons are slightly mm. placed differently and that's about it but most of them look the same yeah um but, but now, now that you're really writing, um, you're probably inserting some important information from previous, site, uh, previous papers, and you'll need a reference manager. Yes. Um, there are some big ones that every, everyone probably knows about, like EndNote or Mendeley or Zotero. Um, however, if you're already using something like Google Docs to work with multiple people, uh, the one that you should, you should definitely consider is Zotero because it you can embed it with your Google Docs and then add the references to Google Docs while you're working on it with multiple people. So it's that's the only really one. Nice. That, yes, it's the only one that so far that I know of that can do that. So that can I hope the other ones are working on that too. Yeah, I would hope so. I mean, because um, that's that's really nice. Yes, a really nice. Um, I do find option. it interesting that the 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 completely open source uh, reference manager, namely Zotero, is the first one to do it, and uh, the other ones that are provided by other things like Microsoft or whatever haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, you'll definitely need a reference manager, and all of them are pretty good. It just depended on how you're working, which one might be slightly better, or what people are used to. Um, so yeah, yes. And then uh, another tip is to really try to switch your wording up and uh, not do the, uh, I just saw a meme about it, moreover. Um, therefore. Therefore. The, the um, most commonly used words. <laughs> too often. Yes. To conclude, mm -hmm. uh, be careful to switch them up. 
and um, don't don't repeat yourself too much because that can get really annoying in the text. And you have certain tools also to um, suggest you synonyms for words that you are using. Yes. And that's really nice to look into. Yeah, I think actually if you're willing to pay for Grammarly, I think the paid version of Grammarly also suggests different uh, yeah. words as well. Uh, but again, I'm sure there are also free options as well indeed. Okay, then uh, back to what we're actually writing. Now that we've done the results and um, our story still makes sense, it's time to start with the introduction. And that's, of course, just lots of reading and um, try to focus on what is actually relevant for your story because as scientists, we, of course, know a lot. But not everything is relevant for the story that you're writing. Uh, and you don't want to just, just go off topic just because you find something interesting, right? Yes. The, the introduction is not the moment to sort of to boast about all the things you've read and no. you know now. That's not the moment. Now no, it's time it should to also not be too long. It should just be to the point. Tell what you actually need for the rest of your paper mm. and get on with it. Yeah, I like to think about it as the introduction is. Uh, imagine your reader is someone who has no idea about your field or at least a little bit of an idea of your field. And then you're just walking them to true like, this is what yeah. insulin secretion is. This is my protein. This is why we're looking at it. This yeah, is what you need but to do. Yeah, but I still... <laughs> I mean, if you're reading a paper about, for example, in my field, LXRs mm -hmm. and cholesterol. Then it gets complicated. I, well, I don't feel like you have to go into too, ma too much detail of like, cholesterol is bad for you. Because no, of course not. No, no. I mean. <laughs> there, there, there's also a balance between like what the reader has to know or at least yeah. assume already. Because obviously your paper is building on previous knowledge already. So Yeah. And uh, sometimes like with my paper, we, we had the problem that it sort of connects two fields. Mm -hmm. And then you have to balance what you're explaining about each field to sort of the readers that come from only one of them, you know? Yeah. And I hope that we did that, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, no fair. So that, that sort of about does it for the introduction. Um, that, that then brings us, at least for uh, what our, our type of writing is, uh, to the materials and methods. And this always takes more time than expected. Yes, definitely. Even all those tiny things that you have to look up, like the manufacturer of a certain compound and going through your lab books again. and Yeah, that uh, the exact catalog number. And sometimes if you're really unlucky, depending on when you did the experiments and which uh, reagents, the reagent is no longer available. And suddenly oh, you're like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, write down the catalog numbers of the stuff you use. Um, and also in your, in your protocols, try to be precise. Mm -hmm not too elaborate no indeed just make sure that what you use you can always find it back to exactly which one what which thing it was and preferably also write it in a way that other people could repeat it yes that's not not always possible from just the materials and medicine and paper that's always no. a shame yes and i think it's also a shame because lots of journals have word limits so like mm. you you kind of have to exclude some parts that like are essential for the reproducibility but they're not the exact compound and how yeah, you, yeah, I really think that then stuff needs to move to the supplementary. Um, the materials mentioned needs to move to the supplementary. Yes, indeed, I agree. Because, yeah, I yeah. think word limits are anyway a bit stupid when you don't have actual... Limits on what, yeah. Well, you don't have actually printed journals anymore, so who cares if your PDF is eight no. pages or seven pages? No, or... true. And I mean, even with printed journals, you can always still link to the electronic supplementary information where everything is described in more detail. But I, yeah, that's a topic for another day, I guess. Yes. In any case, the materials and methods always end up taking longer than you yeah. expect. So uh, be sure to take that along into your planning and write down in detail what you've used, how you did it. And so you, it's easier to write the materials and methods. And then um, I also, by the way, think that materials and methods is a lot e easier after you've already made the figures mm -hmm. uh, because then you know what you actually need to write. Yes. And Often you know what will be in the paper and what not. True. Oftentimes we do a lot of experiments and never actually made it, make it into the paper. Yes. So, uh, um, then the discussion, and that's for me the most difficult part always. Uh, I think it's important to be positive about your research, but truthful. But don't fall into the pit of um, only seeing all the holes in your own research. Because it's important to highlight the good things too. No, for sure. I mean, it's always a balance, right? And I think striking that balance is always a bit difficult. 
Mm -hmm. because obviously the entire reason you're doing your your experiments and doing your research is because it does matter or it is providing some level of information that's important. Mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't end up being the amazing results that you expected when you started, it, it's still information. But obviously, by the time it all finishes, you, you, you know a bit more now and you know what the limitations of all your stuff were. Mm -hmm. So it's always difficult to really strike that balance of like, I know all my weak spots, but should I spend time discussing every single weak spot when I should also be highlighting the results? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's, I find it personally difficult. Uh, at least with writing another paper, I was uh, uh, told that I was being very negative about my results. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we all try to tend to uh, fall into the to the pitfall of um, thinking other people's research is better than ours. Yeah. But be positive in your discussion. <laughs> Sorry. Be positive in your discussion. Yes. And then, of course, it's time to get comments from all your co-authors. Make sure that they're okay with everything that you've written. A very important part that sometimes goes wrong. The whole authorship thing is, anyway, always a hassle. Mm -hmm. uh, and also see what they think about your story. And more often than not, your story needs to change at this point. Uh, and that can be annoying, but important. Because they are the first pe pe other people to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you have asked other people for advice, of course. And you might think that your story makes sense, but maybe it doesn't. No, indeed. And I mean, uh, it could be that they just suggest to change the order a little bit. Um, it could be that the phrasing of something could be slightly different. Mm -hmm. Their comments can range quite a bit. Yes. Um, but it's always good to get extra eyes on the thing and see um, where it can be approved. And I think it's also important to mention, you don't have to take all their suggestions. You True. can choose True. which ones are, uh, ha where they have a point and where probably they don't. Mm-hmm. But it's also good to know that all your co-authors are probably experts in their own separate fields. Um, so where you think they're providing that expertise uh, best is probably where you should be taking it. Yes. Um, so yeah, some last few things. Um, when writing a paper with multiple authors, uh, you'll probably notice that uh, yours and their, refer uh, their writing style probably differs a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you're probably going to notice that very quickly as you write. But um, I think that helps to convey information better to the to the readers as well and make the paper overall better that it's not just one person's way of writing that it's clear to them but maybe not clear to someone else but, but it does need to be consistent throughout yes the paper. it definitely needs one you don't want to say uh have different people say the exact same thing but differently um mm -hmm. like insulin secretion or secretion of insulin or insulin release you you can sort of change it up a little bit but there there needs to be some level of consistency that the reader yeah. knows what you're talking about at every point. Yeah. And then um, once you have, I I personally think that you have to determine what journal you're going to send your paper to after you've already written quite a lot of it. Uh, and at least sort of have made sense of what you're going to present and what you're going to show. Because this is the point where you really know how good it's going to be. Uh, and then you need to send which journal you're going to send it to also take the suggestions of your co-authors, of, of course. And then it's important to read quickly through what your journal is actually expecting for you. And maybe sometimes adaptations need to be made. But there is some debate <laughs> also between us. Yep. If you need to make those adaptations already for your first send-in or if you do that at a later point, if they are already went into the revisions and everything and come back. Yeah. I personally think that you don't have to Adapt your entire paper to the, every journal that you want to send it in, because then if it comes back, you'll have to redo it to another journal, and that's just a hassle. Mm. And if a, a journal is going to say no to your paper because your figures are not as they want, I think... Yeah. No, yeah. I agree 100% with that. I just think, like, we don't know what how the editors decide. We don't know how that process goes, right? So I'm just sort of saying, like, if I were to aim high, then maybe I would like to appease as much as possible the person making the decision at the end to sort of send it to the reviewers or not. But that's just my personal opinion on that. Like, and of course, if you have like a backup journal in mind, uh, you can always sort of see like, there's a lot of overlap here. Mm -hmm. Then I don't need to change it. Regardless of which journal it goes to, I, that's already covered, done. Yeah. Then you don't need to do extra work to change stuff in the end. But that's just my opinion, of course, that... Uh, in the end, you do need to know what journal you're going to send the paper to. That, yes. That's important. And uh, definitely also ask other people for suggestions and 
what they think of your research. Yes, because it's definitely going to matter which uh, the impact factor of journal, how strict and whatever they're going to be. So uh, have yeah, a look. Yeah, but it's also difficult mm -hmm. to judge your own research. No, of course. But I mean, for example, in our field of research, uh, I think we made a joke about nature requiring you to have three different model organisms. Yes. If you don't have three model organisms, often don't come knocking, but uh, <laughs> obviously a joke, of course. But just to know that it might be nice beforehand and how they want. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yes. And it's also okay to, to trust on the opinion of more experienced people. Yes, of course. I mean, they've, done the, they've been around uh, the block a little bit. Yes. So, uh, okay. Well, I think that was all the, the tips and suggestions we have uh, that we have learned from our experience of writing papers. Um, Our long and illustrious career of writing papers. Well, we have a couple now between the both of us. Yes, but um, yeah, it's not 300 or anything like that. No, <laughs> no, we are still just PhD students. So, um, Jaron, what are our social medias again where people can find us? Well, if you uh, like the episode and you want to let us know or you want to ask us a question or whatever, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and a little bit on Pinterest as well. Just uh, as the struggling scientists. Yes, just look up that and you'll find us. Um, we're very active on pretty much all of them. You can also uh, research via our email address, the struggling scientist at hotmail.com or our website, the struggling scientist.com, where we also have really, really nice merch and t shirts and coffee mugs that are science related. So definitely check those out. And in addition to that, we also have a nice newsletter that we release every month with some cool science topics or tips for mental health or uh, extra resources like Notion or whatever that are yes. free to use for scientists and help them out a little bit. And there are some exclusive memes if you're also into that. Uh, yes, in the newsletter. and you can uh, sign up for it via our website. At the bottom of it, there's a nice button where you can sign up for a newsletter. Yes. Okay, well, thank you all for listening and I uh, hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye.